Well, Terry, it's a great privilege to have you here in front of the camera. <laughs> we meet frequently and uh, uh, have many mutual interests. Uh, we are meeting today Professor Terry Kopok from the University of Edinburgh. He is a world... <laughs> Well, Terry, it's a great privilege to have you here in front of the camera. <laughs> we meet frequently and uh, uh, have many mutual interests. Uh, we are meeting today Professor Terry Kopok from the University of Edinburgh. He is a world traveler and a very well-known geographer colleague with a specialty in resource development, regional development, tourism. All of this will emerge, hopefully, in our conversation. So, Terry, tell me about your career? Well, I was born in Cardiff in South Wales in 1921. Uh, I went to school in South Wales and geography was my favourite subject uh, at school. Mm -hmm. uh, but I left school at 16 to go into the civil service, the public service, uh, because there was no possibility of going to university at, in mm -hmm. uh, economic circumstances at those times. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I spent seven years in the army during the war, mainly in the Middle East. And uh, that certainly whetted my appetite for travel yes. and my interest in other places. Although, I mean, my prime interest in geography at school had been because it stimulated my interest in other peoples and other countries and other ways of living. Mm -hmm. And then after the war, I went back into the civil service, again, because there was no other alternative. But then it became possible for me, uh, if I was prepared to commit myself to teaching, to go to university. So I decided to abandon my civil service career and went to Cambridge to read geography. Uh -huh. There's a little sideline to this that might interest you and that is that I was a little uncertain when I came back after the war what I should do mm. and I went to a firm of industrial psychologists uh, to consult them and uh, they put me through various tests and then they said well I should certainly go to university and uh, they advised me either to read biology or geography. I see. Uh, they thought the preference was for biology because uh, perhaps the career opportunities were rather better mm -hmm. for a professional biologist. But I had done no biology at school and uh, I thought well, uh, my first love was geography and I would go to Cambridge mm -hmm. and read geography. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. Who were the professors there at the time? Well, Frank Debenham was the head of the department. He was an Australian who'd been an Antarctic explorer. Yes, yes. And he was a grand old gentleman, but uh, I don't think that he was a, you know, a great intellectual force uh, yeah. in the subject. Yeah. Uh, I suppose the person who influenced me most was Vaughan Lewis, who oh. was uh, a geomorphologist oh. who tragically died in the 1950s in a car crash in the United oh. States. But he was a great enthusiast and uh, uh, it, it was infectious. Yes. Uh, and I, I took geomorphology and, and um, economic geography as my special subjects. Mm -hmm. The other person was, uh, uh, I've forgotten her Christian name now, Anderson, mm -hmm. Mar uh, Margaret Anderson, mm -hmm. who uh, was a biogeographer. Mm -hmm. uh, and she has not left much in the way of written work, but again, she was a, a very effective teacher. She used to walk straight up and down, arms of Kimber, up the road, up and down the, the platform, and uh, it would come out with great clarity. and. Uh, it, you know, it opened a door that uh, I had not seen through before. I see. mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I started to do research at, univers at Cambridge on uh, uh, the evolution of hill slopes, a geomorphological topic. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, one day I was invited to go down to London to meet Clifford Darby. Mm -hmm. 
and we spent the day together and then at the end he said, well, how about it? And I said, well, how about what? And he said, well, <laughs> would you like to come to University College? Uh, so uh, I said, well, I'd like to think about it. But he made it quite clear he didn't want a geomorphologist. Uh, he wanted somebody on the, on the human side. And of course, that was my other string to my bow. Yes. He also wanted me, if I came, to um, do a land use survey of the Chilterns. That's an area northwest of London. Mm -hmm because it was approaching the 50th anniversary of the department and he wanted so, to have a book that uh, yes. tied various things together in this mm -hmm. way. So that's how I got launched on this particular uh, right. strand. But I should have said that when I was at Cambridge, I used to go to lectures by the Professor of Agriculture, Sir Frank Engeldau, mm -hmm. uh, which was about agriculture in a world uh, mm -hmm. context, had a strong geographical flavour yes. about it. Yes. And indeed, I. I uh, dedicated my first uh, my agricultural atlas of England and Wales to Sir Frank Engeldau and got him to write a foreword uh, oh, to it uh, some years later. Mm. Mm. So uh, there I was then at University College for uh, 15, 16 years, uh, specialising particularly on agricultural geography. Mm -hmm. And then I was appointed to the Chair of Geography in Edinburgh. And it was just about that time that I was becoming aware that uh, recreation was an increasingly important aspect of use of rural land. Mm. Now the year you went to Edinburgh? Well, it's mm. just the beginning of 66, the end of 65, mm. 66, that was my transition. Mm -hmm. And um, I wrote a paper which appeared in the Dutch uh, language periodical literature for mm. economic and sociale yes. geography, um, in which I pulled together all that was known, as far as I could find out, about uh, okay, this really? topic. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's a bit of a compendium, but it's something of a landmark yes. because it was one of the first times, in, at least in British geography, mm. that that had been mentioned. Yes. And uh, I, shortly after I came to Edinburgh, I got a grant from the Natural Environment Research Council uh, to start an investigation into the impact of outdoor recreation on the countryside in central Scotland. And that led to building up a small team of people, uh, initially geographers, but increasingly multidisciplinary. Yes. We eventually, I eventually established a tourism and recreation research unit, mm -hmm. uh, which at one stage had about 20 people in it, and uh, which has produced uh, a series of, I think, significant uh, um, reports on various aspects. Mm. Uh, but I must stress that that work, uh, although it's got a strong, strong geographical flavor, mm. and, and my interest, of course, is primarily geographical, mm. is a multidisciplinary one. Yeah. Very important, yeah. I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'd also developed an interest in automated cartography. It seemed to me, from quite an early stage with the development of computers, that this mm -hmm. was going to give us the potential to handle data mm -hmm. uh, in ways which had not previously been possible. Yes. Uh, I mean, it, my, my impression was that we as geographers spent so much time uh, putting our facts together and putting them down that we were then too exhausted perhaps to do the, the full explorations and thinking that we ought to do about them. Uh, and I started off in a very, mi very minor sort of way, very primitive sort of way, uh, using a modified land line printer to produce uh, agricultural maps. Mm -hmm. And uh, that again has led, off to, led to the development of a small uh, unit in Edinburgh doing that sort of work. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't like to put myself forward as an expert in this field, but uh, I certainly saw the need for it. Yes, 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 indeed. Mm. Don't you think that that is one of our biggest needs, is this graphic language to express succinctly yes. what we have yeah. come up with from our travels and explorings, yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sure about that, and I think, you know, it, it's one of the things that is absolutely fundamental for the next ten years or so in geography, that. Uh, better ways of handling and analyzing spatial data. Yes. Uh, mm. And um, mm. that's going to, it's our opportunity. If we don't grasp it, I think uh, we'll find that other people have done so. But uh, that, of course, led off in other directions too, because uh, I have represented the Royal Society, that is the Premier British Academy, mm. uh, on the, uh, the Ordnance Survey Map Users Committee for a number of years. Mm. And then when, in 1978, the government set up a, a committee looking to the long-term future of the, the Ordnance Survey, our national mapping agency, uh, the Royal Society suggested me as a member of this. And uh, again, I mean, I was the only geographer on this group, but 
I think its work has been important and, uh, and will be important for the future of, of British mapping. Yes, indeed. Uh, the cartography side of you, I mean, where did that begin? Was it at London or at Cambridge? I mean, the strong cartographic orientation. Well, it's largely sort of self-induced uh, because when I was given this task in 1950 of, of undertaking this land use survey, I decided to switch my um, research interests uh, from geomorphology uh, to uh, land use and uh, changing land use. And that it led me to get involved with uh, agricultural statistics. Uh, uh, these are collected in great detail in Britain for quite small units. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a major problem of <laughs> about handling that. Mm -hmm. Though the first thing it seemed to me was important and something we've not been as good as we ought to be about was understanding the nature of the data and its spatial limitations. I mean, the, the, the data that is nominally under uh, administrative areas in Britain in, in relation to agricultural censuses is not contained within the uh, administrative boundary. I know it's a rather complicated idea, but, no, but I can um, understand. unless you understand it, you yeah. can't know how to map them properly. So it was something born of necessity. Mm. Uh, I mean, I did something like half a million calculations by slide rule oh. and ma manual plotting uh, at an early stage in that. And if you want a way to convince you uh, of uh, the advantages <laughs> of computing, then uh, that, that's it. Yes, mm. I think it's one yeah. of the, yes. Mm. Mm. Yes, but there has been this, uh, the first survey was for a publication, yes? yes, but this later work has more of an, a practical interest, an applied interest. Well, yes, I mean, I've produced, as you probably know, a, a series of agricultural actresses of England and Wales and of Scotland. Uh, initially, these were uh, produced uh, with a computer base and then drawn manually, but then subsequently uh, produced as computer output for direct uh, plate making from that. Mm. Now, um, they, they were more than atlases because they were essentially uh, descriptions and, and, and attempted explanations of, of what was shown. And there's probably more text than there is, uh, than is atlas. Mm. Um, the other work you're referring to, yes, it, but it's not me involved as, as a cartographer. It's me is involved as a member of, of committees uh, looking at applications of cartography. I mean, first in relation to the Ordnance Survey, mm. and then I was another, a member of another committee uh, looking at the mapping requirements of the Natural Environment Research Council, mm. uh, which is very much involved in automated cartography and, yes. and how it ought to develop. Yes. Um, but of course, that too has a much wider implication. And then I got involved uh, as a member of um, a committee producing evidence for a select committee on remote sensing and digital mapping uh, representing the Royal Society and representing the Royal Geographical Society. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I've become perhaps a, an exponent rather than a practitioner. No, if that's the, the right word, I'm not quite sure. But, but uh, you're seen as geography's mm -hmm. man mm -hmm. in, these, uh, in these various... Uh, well, elder statesman perhaps, yes. <laughs> well, yes, whatever. Uh, but the there are lots of younger people doing much more active work than I am in this field. And, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, well, I'm certain you deserve that position, but the distinction I'm trying to make mm. is between those in cartography yes. who are primarily concerned about the aesthetics and the graphic yes. precision and so on, from a theoretical point of view, yes. and those who want to make mapping useful for yes. societal interests, and you mm -hmm. have both interests. It seems. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's, it's always seemed to me in geography, it's rather like the old lady uh, who said, how can I know what I think till I hear what I say, uh, <laughs> until you've mapped you don't know what the questions you're really going to ask are. Right. Uh, that, well, that, that's true of some geographical problems, mm. and, and many, I think, that mm. uh, we are concerned with. Mm. Although now, remote sensing and, uh, of course, the ability to, to see uh, phenomena from the air uh, raise questions in your mind without the necessity of mapping. You can have the direct experience, if you like, and yes. see, well, the, these are problems, these are puzzling aspects of man's use of the earth service and yes. how they come about. And yes, but you have been a great traveler. That's true, and yes. You've seen uh, landscapes mm, from the air. Mm. Do you see a direct link with your cartographic interest and your travel interest? No, I don't think so, no. no I mean, uh, I, my cartographic interest has come primarily from the need to handle uh, okay. census-type statistical data. Although, 
I mean, I see through remote sensing, of course, that uh, um, the direct sensing of data and its cartographic representation are coming together very closely, and uh, that will be an increasing need uh, in the future. I think it's yeah. very exciting. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes, but it, there's two images, you see, the cartographer who is at home yes. studying the detail versus the pers the explorer, in a way, who yes. has to represent what he has just experienced graphically. Ah, uh, yes, I'm an explorer from the air on commercial airlines rather than an explorer in, in, the, in the other sense. Yes, uh, yes. Well, tell uh, about your travels. You really have traveled quite a bit. Yes, uh, I must say it did something for me the first time I flew around the world. Uh, um, it's a purely psychological thing, I think, but... Uh -huh. I, to start off in the same place and go westbound and come back to the, the same place. Uh, uh, yes, well, I think I've I think I've been in every major country in the world and certainly in every continent, with the exception of Antarctica. Uh, and I still find travel extremely exciting. My great problem is to persuade airlines that I want a seat, a window seat with a clear view of the ground. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and my preference, of course, is for flying in air aircraft like Fokker Friendships. Uh, High wing monoplanes with large windows that <laughs> you can look out of. Most uh, exceptional yes, passenger. Uh, yes, and, uh, yes, yes. Uh, but it, it's, it's irritating when you, I mean, it's only natural when you look at uh, maps, uh, satellite imagery of the Earth's surface, how much of it is cloud covered at any one time. And yes. mm. although flying above the clouds may be fine in terms of smooth passages, it's, for a geographer, it's extremely irritating. Right, right, I can well imagine. But a European geographer also, I think, is much more sensitive to the flying yes, walls. Yes, that is true, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll fly point to point. Yeah. To landscape. <laughs> yes, which of those travels now, what, what, was, what impressed you most? Was it, was it the sense of achievement, conquest of distance, or was it uh, to study variations? Landscape. Well, I think it varied with the, with the journey. Uh, when I flew the other day from Tokyo to Moscow across Siberia by day, uh, and the mile after mile uh, of uh, little occupied land uh, was displayed beneath the aircraft, uh, it couldn't but impress you of the, of the vastness and emptiness of, uh, of Siberia. Oh, that's a very naive observation, I know. But uh, I think the, the thing traveling from the air has done for me uh, is um, you know, give a, a direct impact of, of things that I knew about in a way, but uh, mm -hmm. there is an image which uh, is retained mentally uh, in a much more vivid form than you could possibly get by reading the best descriptions there are. Or even are. looking at an atlas. Quite, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So, I, I mean, I do believe that travel is essential for geographers. Yes. And, uh, uh, it remains for me an exciting uh, uh, business. Mm. Mm. Culturally, what, what has struck you most from your travels? Well, culturally, one of the things that strikes me most, and this again may be a naive observation, uh, is uh, as far as the big cities of the world are concerned, the increasing cultural similarity. Um, I think one sees this most in respect of young people. Mm. Uh, I know Alistair Cook, uh, talking in North American cities some years back, said that you could be deposited in any one of them blindfold, and you, well, with few exceptions, like San Francisco and possibly New York, you wouldn't know where it was, where you were. Mm. And uh, certainly at a, a level of superficial cultural similarity, mm. Uh, th this has struck me increasingly in, in Rio or in Moscow or in Beijing or mm. uh, in Sydney, mm. um, that uh, this degree of, of, of similarity, and I wonder to what extent, I mean, there is uh, a, a cultural convergence in that way. I think it's there to some degree, and yes. it's yes. maybe superficially, but... Uh, or the, the techno systems in Yes, Tuesday. yes, well, I think that that is also true, yes. Mm. Yes. Uh -huh. And you can bring all that back home to your teaching and research. Yes, I have a vast collection of colour slides taken from, from aircraft. And while I wouldn't go along with one of my colleagues, uh, not my colleague in Edinburgh, who insists that no one shall show a slide uh, in a regional course which he or she has not taken himself or herself, uh -huh. uh, I do think that uh, something you have taken yourself uh, gives an immediacy uh, to a talk, uh, to a lecture, uh -huh that is not otherwise possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree with you entirely, yes. Uh, so you have many activities, teaching, research, consultant, various commissions and boards. Yes, and far too many, I'm afraid. Yes, <laughs> and you still have time for, uh, your, for your own 
personal research curiosities. Yes, well, I think that, that is an essential. Uh, if uh, once a geographer loses that interest, once any academic loses that interest, then he really ought to give up, I think. And, yes, uh, yes. But far too much of my time has been <coughs> taken up over the last ten years in work sitting on government committees and uh, yes. uh, working with various other organisations. Mm. I mean, I'm a member of the Scottish Sports Council, for example, <laughs> which comes out of my recreational interest. Yes. Uh, and that probably takes a day a week, uh, up to a day a week of my time throughout the year. Uh, and when trip. you multiply that by perhaps 20 other committees, it, uh, it takes up an awful lot of time. But there are spin-offs, of course, that uh, there are benefits and contacts with people and uh, seeing things in different ways mm. that uh, compensate mm. for this. And uh, I mean, I have a, a lot of interest in that, you know, in, in that anyway as a topic. Yes, I can mm. see. Yes, for example, your membership of the Sports Council, I imagine, is, is helpful in your work on tourism and recreation. I'm really fascinated by what you're doing in that field. Well, in fact, uh, the officer who works to my committee, I'm chairman of the Facilities Planning Committee in the Scottish Sport, Sports Council, is a geographer who was a professor of geography in Canada, mm -hmm. and uh, we have a close relationship there. In fact, we're writing a joint paper on planning for recreation. Professor Watson? No, this is not yeah. Professor Watson. Uh, uh, this is Iva Davis, who was at Lakehead uh, University. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, most of my work there has been in relation to the Tourism and Recreation Research Unit. Uh, and I've had increasingly to move into a multidisciplinary field there, because uh, while we have been very Im important, we as geographers have been very important in, un in identifying some of the spatial characteristics and spatial uh, impacts of, of outdoor recreation, uh, when it comes to understanding the motivations, mm. uh, then we have to join hands with our sociologists and social psychologist friends. Mm. Uh, and that's certainly the direction in which these kinds of studies are moving. Mm. Our interest, uh, my interest particularly, had been in rural areas, and I think that this is a natural for geographers because the resource and uh, the home base are necessarily uh, widely spaced. There is a journey to play, uh, there are important interactions with rural communities mm. and with rural um, uh, resources. Mm. And we've just been doing an interesting study for a group of public agencies in Britain uh, called uh, the Economic uh, Wellbeing of Communities in National Parks in England and Wales. Now that may sound very strange to you, but communities yes, national, national parks in England and Wales have quite substantial communities living within them. They are not publicly owned land, they are land designated because of their scenic beauty and mm -hmm. uh, other characteristics and they contain living communities within them uh, and they are in private ownership and they are used for agriculture and for forestry and so on. But of course the idea of conserving that landscape is to some extent at variance uh, with the idea of the well-being of the communities, and it's a matter of, of reconciling that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also part of the legislation to establish national parks that uh, the bodies responsible are, must promote uh, the enjoyment of these areas by the public. Yes. So there are three sets of interests which have to be reconciled, and that, uh, again, was a, to me as a geographer a very interesting topic. Mm -hmm. Have any of those people moved out? The people who, whose farmsteads are enclosed within yes. national parks? Well, I mean, they, they share many of the same characteristics of the remoter rural areas of Britain anyway. They are areas of rural depopulation. Mm -hmm. But of course, they are also, some of them at least, important tourist areas like the Lake District mm -hmm. or like Exmoor. Uh, and uh, of course, this has attracted a large number of people. Uh, the uh, tourism and recreation provides uh, part of the economic base of these areas and one of the questions we were looking at was how far can tourism uh, provide a satisfactory basis for uh, community existence in these areas and in many ways it seemed that it, it is a very satisfactory one because uh, there are few jobs available for women in these areas uh, you can generate jobs fairly quickly and fairly cheaply by comparison with other yes. activities mm -hmm. And although it has something of a name of a, as a bad employer, uh, mm -hmm. cheap labor, cheap seasonal labor, uh, I think that there is potential there uh, that, that's mm -hmm. important to look at. 
But I was thinking more of the, the efficiency yeah. imperative on anyone involved with agriculture. Yes. Say, uh, whether it would be impossible for a small farmstead to survive. Well, I mean, this is part of a problem of the British landscape overall because uh, the forces within agriculture uh, are encouraging farm enlargement, encouraging enlargement of fields, uh, and uh, these are inconsistent uh, with the characteristics of the British landscape, particularly the, the landscape of lowland England, uh, as it's evolved over the centuries. Uh, in fact, the paper I wrote for this conference was entitled Conservation and Agriculture and was looking at the interaction between uh, agriculture, and particularly uh, crop cultivation mm. and agriculture, and, one of the, and, and conservation. One of the um, appro approaches we suggested in our report uh, was the possibility of uh, a compensation, a subsidy if you like, to farmers to farm in traditional ways because farmers were acting quite naturally as economic man uh, to a situation of uh, prices and uh, of uh, uh, of technical developments mm -hmm. uh, and we suggested that uh, they could uh, be compensated uh, they could be encouraged to employ more labor than they would otherwise do they mm -hmm. could be encouraged to maintain features like stone walls and uh, mm -hmm. uh, hedgerows and so on which are characteristic features now Obviously, you couldn't do this over throughout the country as a whole, but uh, there are certainly uh, trends in thinking in conservation circles in Britain uh, which uh, are favourable to that kind of approach. Is there any hope of dialogue between the agrarian interests and the conservation interests? Yes, I think so. Um, we've developed what a, a, a series of groups, farming and wildlife advisory groups, or in Scotland, farming, forestry and wildlife advisory groups, mm which bring together conservationists and uh, conservation disposed farmers uh, to try and show how land can be farmed uh, in ways which are consistent with conservation interests. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hope that uh, this will have a, a spread effect. Mm -hmm. um, the Countryside Commission in England and Wales, which is the body responsible for scenic conservation, has just published a document suggesting that uh, it develop a series of linked farms to the, to the farms in the far farming and wildlife advisory groups uh, to try and uh, sp spread this, the effects of this knowledge of how this can be done. Uh, there is a dispute in, in Britain of how, whether this ought to be a subject for planning control, whether farmers ought to be prevented from doing things. Yes. But I think the general consensus is that one ought to be trying to create a situation where it's in farmers' own interest Mm -hmm. uh, to conserve uh, landscape features and to conserve wildlife. Mm -hmm. uh, it's unreasonable to complain about farmers doing what is uh, a response to government policy uh, for agriculture uh, designed for other purposes. Yes, yes. Oh, that yeah. should be an enormous challenge. <laughs> it is. Um, I, but I think it's going to happen in Europe too. I mean, I think that there is already <coughs> within, for example, the less favoured areas directive mm -hmm. of the European Economic Commission yes. uh, the basis for an approach of that kind. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's exciting. It is indeed, this yes. Is your tourism yeah. interest. I want to move to another yes, yes. aspect of your work, Terry. You're from the Celtic Fringe. Yes, marginally. Uh, I'm yes. very, I'm very uh, uh, proud to also uh, be mm -hmm. Celtic. Uh, and I think Scotland, Wales, and maybe Ireland mm -hmm. have contributed quite substantially to English geography. Yes. Uh, Would you like to comment a little on how you Well, think? I think there are quite a large number of Welshmen uh, yes. occupying uh, positions in British geography and, uh, and in chairs in English universities. Mm -hmm. My predecessor on the British National Committee for Geography uh, was Clifford Darby, uh, yes. who is a very distinguished Welshman too. I've just uh, had as a colleague Reeford Watson, uh, mm -hmm. who combines being a Canadian and a Scot, I think. Yes. Uh, uh, but. Uh, uh, we've a very lively department in Edinburgh. Um, mm. I don't know that I can identify any specific uh, uh, Celtic uh, contribution in this sense, but of course the physical makeup of Wales and of, of mm. Scotland, with its predominance of upland and mm. large areas of, of moorland, uh, its marginal farming conditions, uh, does create circumstances which uh, uh, have demanded different adjustments mm -hmm. uh, and of course we've each inherited 
farming systems, traditional farming systems, which in the Scottish context were of course fossilized uh, by legislation in the late 19th century in the yes. crofting counties. Yes. Yes. Um, but incidentally that shows that it isn't very easy by legislation to uh, hold back uh, the tide because uh, many of those crofts now are either farmed in absentia or uh, owned in absentia, occupied in absentia, uh, are not uh, farmed or run down and mm. uh, the proportion that are actively cultivated is still mm. quite small. Yes. Oh, I think the, there's questions being posed about the legislative approach yes. to solving problems all over Europe, yes. not just in history. We seem to not learn from yeah. history. Yeah. No, but I think this Welsh uh, thing must have been related to some very strong, powerful teachers at Aberystwyth yeah. or someplace, because there's certainly a whole generation of Welshmen who have influenced yes. English geography. Yes, well, uh, I can't claim to be among that group in the sense that uh, I went uh, rather late in life to Cambridge, and yes. although uh, and, and Clifford Darby had moved on from then, mm. uh, but you're certainly right, as far as Aberystwyth is concerned, and Emerysbury, and of course Fleur, uh, who was earlier there, Esther uh, Evans, Esther Evans uh, these are all people who've uh, had an influence. Mm -hmm. and, uh, perhaps the Welsh way with wor words has had an important influence uh, uh, in this respect. Celtic uh, way with the Celtic words. words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how would you characterize the present situation in geography in England generally? It seems to be prolific in its production. Mm. Uh, how would you characterize the situation? Well, we're going through a very difficult time at present because uh, the government has been cutting back on university expenditure mm. in uh, uh, generally and we've had to take our share of that. I mean, to take my own department in Edinburgh, uh, we have lost four members of staff over the last three years, and we've only had one replacement. And we're being told to look at the possibilities of 5% reduction per annum, 10% reduction per annum over the next few years. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy uh, to accommodate. And it doesn't help uh, in two respects. It doesn't help new posts be created. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps people like me ought to get out so that younger people can come on. But, uh, and of course, it doesn't help in new initiatives uh, to be started. Um, what we must do there, I think, is, uh, is link ourselves to some of the areas which government itself recognizes as important. Information technology is a classic example which relates to automated cartography, yes. which relates to remote sensing. Yes. And two of our main outlets for geographers in recent times have now, at least temporarily, been blocked. Uh, I mean, many geographers did initially go into teaching. This was particularly true, you know, before the, war, the Second World War and mm. immediately afterwards. Then planning became a major outlet. Um, mm. Something like 40% of the graduates entering graduate planning schools in Britain at one stage were, were geographers. Mm. Uh, but that is something also that, because of government for cuts back in uh, finance, have mm. been. Uh, uh, a, a door that has been closed temporarily. Uh, now, I mean, many of our um, geographers have been going off into business as business, uh, administrative trainees, going off into market research, going off into a wide variety of jobs. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I say the current situation is not uh, helpful for geography, I think, mm -hmm. in, in this respect. Has it discovered any alternative uh, directions for itself? Well, I, what is surprising to me, and with those two areas blocked, as it were, mm. um, that we haven't had uh, more serious problems of, mm -hmm. uh, of getting uh, employment for our graduates uh, than we have. Mm. Um, my own view is that geography is an excellent background, a be excellent basis, not background, a mm. basis for um, a postgraduate training of some kind, and this needn't necessarily be in geography, but in a related field, in soils, uh, in, in planning, in conservation, and uh, in recreation management, a whole series of fields. Uh, I think, too, we've got to develop uh, master's programs of our own of that kind. Uh, we're looking at the moment uh, at a master's degree in geographical information systems, which I think is going to be an important area of how to handle data and how to organize data and mm -hmm. uh, what sort of questions to ask of data, yes. and mm -hmm. what are the characteristics of data. These mm -hmm. are some of the important questions which we've tended to neglect uh, in the past. Yes. 
But we're doing this on uh, reduced resources, it doesn't, doesn't help. Mm. Well, poverty can be helpful. Oh, yes. Concentrates the mind. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. So, I mean, you all learned that yes. through the war. Well, when I think, yes, when I think after the war, when I joined University College in 1950, uh, there were five of us. Uh, when I left in 1965, there were 25 of us. Um, and while in part this reflects the growth of the subject. It's, mm. it's not possible, I think, now for any one individual mm. uh, to be a master of the whole of the subject. Uh, but uh, I think uh, some of my younger colleagues don't appreciate uh, fully uh, how well off we are in, in many circumstances in relation to uh, facilities. I mean, we have just moved to a situation now where we have a departmental fax computer. We have, we're having uh, installed a terminal in each room of each member of the faculty oh. and uh, that will uh, relate us to word processing, it will relate us to graphics, it will relate us to uh, mm -hmm. a whole variety of uh, opportunities mm -hmm. and we've something like what, 10 mini computers in the department and access to um, mainframe computers and you know, our new generation of graduates is, is computer literate in a way that the older among us are not. Mm -hmm. uh, are they literate uh, in other areas? No, and I think that's a major, major problem. And uh, I like the idea that uh, one of the products of a, a geographical education should somebody be somebody who is uh, numerate, uh, literate, and, and in Billy Bolton's word, I don't like it, graphicate. Uh, yes. <laughs> that who is able to think spatially and to use spatial means of communication, who can write clear uh, English and who can express himself well, uh, and who is able to uh, use numerical data to, to make sense of numerical data. And if we send our graduates into the world with those three characteristics, I think they should do well. Yes, I think yeah. so too. It's yeah. the other, the backup from the humanistic yes. side and yes. the understanding side that people, gets yeah. people worried when they hear about a whole department equipped like yours. But, you know, I mean, I don't think that means that we are all uh, high-powered model builders. Yeah. Uh, and after all, uh, you take a subject like the Doomsday Geography of England. Mm -hmm. Now, that involves an immense manipulation of data. Yes. Uh, that is something that could so much more readily have been done yes. uh, if it had been computer-based. Now, the, the, the time wasn't right when it started, but when I think of all those long division sums and all that manual plotting, and when I think of the tasks ahead of us, uh, yes. then it seems to me these are aids to doing better some of the things we've done traditionally in the past. And uh, while I, I am fully sympathetic to ideas of model building and to uh, theor ideas of theoretical geography, mm. uh, and I am sympathetic to the challenges that are being made to us uh, to look at our, the assumptions we bring, mm. um, I still think that in many ways these are developments which enable us to do some of the things that we've been doing for a very long time, but to do them better. I, I, I really do agree uh, with you. I've been doing some experimenting more recently. The one final mm. question. You who have had so many friends around the world mm. and traveled so much, uh, one of the problems today is that we're not able to learn from each other in various countries. Mm. There are exciting things happening in Edinburgh and Seattle maybe still, and in Japan maybe. Uh, do you think that if geographers who are graduating in mm. your cluster on geographic information systems, mm -hmm. do you think that they can uh, be better equipped to think about the question of international communication among geographers? Well, I, agree. I do, because it seems to me that one of the increasingly important things in the world is that we have to think about the world as a whole. I mean, now, this has always been part of geography, mm. um, but it's now a practical necessity. Mm. And uh, intercommunication of data, intercommunication of ideas, mm. is going to be extremely important. We were talking yesterday to an international agency about this question. How do you know what is going on? How do you know who is expert in particular areas? How do you know what has been done? Mm. How do you know what information is available? And those are extremely important questions, which we have now the potential uh, to answer. Mm. They require a lot of way in the way of organization yes. uh, uh, to get them off the ground in ways that uh, uh, can be universally applied. But I, I think this is a most exciting time uh, to be alive. I hope I'm still going by the time some of these things come to fruition. Well, I certainly hope you do, and I'm sure you will, because that is a tremendous challenge, and uh, that's been a mark of a lot of your work. You have really pushed 
us to think along fresh lines and be hopeful about what we're doing. I want to thank you so much for coming today. I know we have lots more we could talk about, but this has been most fruitful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.